and of course, thank you to the Brooks uh, Memorial Library for hosting us this afternoon. Um, like she mentioned, my name is Jacob Pelletier, and on behalf of Vermont Humanities, I would wel like to welcome you all to our special event as a part of our fall festival, Where We Land. During National Arts and Humanities Month, we have hosted events across the state centered around themes of stories and their effects on us and our communities. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to just thank some of our partners who made this event possible. First of all, a huge thank you to BCTV for being here and recording the event today. Um, we really appreciate the support. And then also a huge uh, thank you to Vermont Public, our media sponsor for the whole festival, as well as University of Vermont and their support with this program as well. Um, some of you may have also found some s surveys on your seats um, that's being conducted by the Vermont Arts Council. Uh, this survey measures the economic and social impact of the arts across our state and is a national survey that we're conducting on behalf of the, the Economic Arts Project. Um, and if you do complete this survey, please find me afterwards, whether you do it in paper or QR code, and I will be awarding you a copy of Sarah Hench's book, We Contain Multitudes, our Vermont Reads 2021 book, as well as a nice little journal for your pleasure. Um, so, and we do have more copies of the survey up here if you'd like one. And now finally, our event will last about 90 minutes, uh, beginning with a presentation from Andrew Ingle uh, before he leads us through a reflective exercise. Uh, so get ready to have some fun with that. And then we'll be hearing from the second half of our event um, from representatives from community organizations supporting migrant communities in the greater Brattleboro area. Um, and I would like to thank you all again for being here and welcome Andrew Ingle on stage. Um, he has been working in the arts and cultural and community or engagement for over 20 years. And as a curator, a scholar, a writer, performer, and producer, uh, he received his BA from Columbia College and a master's in arts and performance studies from the Tisch School of the New York University. Um, and he has been collaborating with healthcare workers, producers, artists, um, libraries, and a bunch of other organizations across the, the Northeast. So thank you, Andy, for being here today. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, again, thank you to Vermont Humanities, Jacob Pelletier, Christopher Kostman Ilstrup, who's also here today. Um, thank you, Brooks Memorial Library. Thank you to my hosts, um, Richard Wazanski uh, and Todd uh, Mandel for, um, for your hospitality. And uh, I'm gonna suggest to my colleagues here on the stage, you might wanna go out there so you can see the slides. Welcome, bienvenidos. Hushamadid, providing you with a complete biography of Warren and Leon, my queer ancestors, is like trying to curate a collection of antique porcelain, china, or crystal. Some pieces are pristine, some are chipped, some don't make any sense at all in this collection, and some pieces are completely lost. My project, Warlay Yesterday and Today, is an attempt to reconstruct these fragments. Part of that work is filling in the gaps to conjure what's not there. So I'm asking myself, what if, could it be, perhaps? I've found published essays, letters, and poems written by Warren. Uh, that's him on the right with the dog. Nikki, um, I've discovered artwork by Leon, standing, as well as antiques and objects that they sold and gifted, some of which were ultimately gifted to me. And ultimately, I located my most important primary sources, friends of Warren and Leon, living in Wyndham County and Queens, New York. Leon and Warren died in 2002 and 2007, respectively. Um, had I actually met and interviewed them, I'm not even sure they'd provide answers to all my questions. There are experiences that are just too painful to share, and there are events and relationships that we keep private. In 1980, they left New York and moved to Townsend, a life of semi-retirement in a small town. They bought a property that included 10 acres, a brick federal style farmhouse, a sugar shack, two sheds, and a garage built in the 1960s, 
which you can see here on the left of the house. They converted that garage into an antique store. The exterior was unremarkable, but walking inside was like entering a portal to another world. It was a cabinet of curiosities. They proudly informed customers that Worley specialized in fine European antiques. And according to one of my interview subjects, if a tourist showed up at their doorstep in search of early Americana, Warren and Leon practically chased them away. Warren would bark, we have no country furniture. They loved Europe. That was where Leon entered the fashion industry in 1930s Berlin. And in the years after World War II, Warren worked as a journalist and learned the antiques trade in the south of France. Here's a photo taken last year at the former location of Worley on Manhattan's Upper, Upper East Side. The original boutique, which they co-founded in 1958, sold objects but also traded in aspirations of European elegance, luxury, and sophistication. Their business grew into furniture restoration, art framing, and interior decorating. And I suppose Leon, or Leon, with an accent aigu over the E, had a special allure to clients because of his previous work as a designer in Berlin, Paris, London, and New York. In the year Worley opened, 1958, the New York Times described it as, quote, a jewel box of a boutique. And here's a quote. In the window, reposing on a bed of luscious red felt is a hot chocolate service of eggshell Sevres China. Within the boutique, a crimson rug continues the red theme of the window decor. Rich blue is splashed over the walls and shelves are laden with everything from French cologne to Italian alabaster paperweights studded with tiny gold bugs. The Worley brand was all about refinement, urbanity, and worldliness. Later, in the fall of 1958, Q Magazine, which was the precursor to New York Magazine, also featured a blurb. Quote, it is just six months old and well worth either a browsing or buying visit. Worley is tiny, but neat. No jumble shop this. On the elegant side, it offers the best of the old combined with the best of the new. I wonder if Warren actually wrote that copy. As a journalist and writer, Warren without a doubt had the skills to craft a press release, to pitch a story to a magazine or newspaper, and the press contacts needed to promote a new business. Q Magazine's blurb ends with this, quote, Warren Cronemeyer, Worley's owner, has opened this boutique as a branch of a shop he operated on the Riviera for 10 years. New Yorkers will make him welcome again in his hometown. But Q got one fact wrong. Warren was not the sole owner of Worley. All you have to do is look at the logo. First thing you notice is the unique lettering, most likely hand-drawn by Leon. Uh, Worley is a portmanteau word. In French, porte means to carry, manteau means coat. A portmanteau is a wardrobe trunk. Two parts hinge together. You flip the trunk on its vertical side, and voila. In one section, you hang your garments, and in the other, you store shoes, hats, undergarments, and other accessories in drawers. In his writing, Lewis Carroll invented portmanteau words. These are nouns, verbs, and adjectives that combine two words into one. So for example, if 
Alice and Humpty Dumpty were here today, they might be discussing Brexit while chillaxing over brunch. Um, Leon's career in fashion began in Weimar, Berlin. Although born into an assimilated Jewish family in Russia, his teenage years and young adulthood were in Germany. Two key archives help me learn a bit about Leon's early professional life. I located a dossier on Leon and his parents at the French National Archives in Paris. Between 1936 and 1938, Leon paid several visits to the French consulate in Berlin. He sought permission to travel to Paris for work. In visa applications, he stated that his employer, Max Berendt, sent him to Paris four times a year to purchase samples of haute couture gowns. Between the wars, Berlin had a substantial ready-to-wear fashion industry. They would copy the latest fashions for mass production. And by the mid-1920s, there were 80,000 companies, half of them Jewish-owned. And they employed around 200,000 workers, including Leon. The second archive I discovered is in Townsend, and it contains evidence of Leon's work in fashion. The Thompson family was part of Leon and Warren's circle of friends. Warren and Leon recognized that Eliza Thompson, at a very young age, expressed an interest in art and design. Warren and Leon designated Liza as the keeper of Leon's sketches, illustrations, drawings, news clippings, and other ephemera. Like all Jewish-owned businesses, Max Barron's company was ultimately liquidated by the Nazis. But Max had the foresight and resources to open a satellite business in England. He emigrated to London in 1935. Four years later, Barron assembled a team of former employees who also had the luck and the financial resources to escape the Nazis. That team included Leon. I know this because Liza's collection includes this invitation to the opening of Barron's first and last collection with his new British company. The card is dated September 6th, 1939, just five days after Hitler invaded Poland. But the start of World War II was not going to stop the fashion world. With Leon's help, Barrett launched a collection of sports suits, dresses, gowns, and skirts. On the front of the invitation is an illustration of a woman in high heels. She's wearing a dress with shoulder pads appropriate for a football player. The hemline is just below the knee. The waist is tiny. Lots of fabric to emphasize and widen the hips. Her cigarette smoke curls elegantly in the air like her hourglass figure. And this feminine archetype appears again and again in Leon's illustrations and drawings. Think Joan Crawford, who starred in The Women, a film that was released in 1939, the same year Leon designed the collection. I know this row's gonna get that reference. Powerful, cool, severe, unapproachable. So the discovery of this invitation, along with the French visa application, offered me some evidence of how Leon supported himself during his sojourn in London. To learn about the next chapter of Leon's migration story, I relied on a dossier housed in the New England Historic Genealogical Society. It's Leon's case file from Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Hyas remains the oldest resettlement organization in the world, now serving immigrants and refugees of all backgrounds. And I wanna add that they also have a special initiative to focus on LGBTQ plus uh, refugees. 
This dossier includes an affidavit signed by my grandfather, Morris, on behalf of Leon. Morris served as guarantor for many relatives of mine escaping anti-Semitism who were longing for freedom and seeking opportunity. He himself had arrived in Boston from a town in Ukraine just a few decades before Leon did. Leon sailed from England on the SS Samaria on November 8, 1940. Morris and Grandma Bess took Leon in, but he only stayed there a few months. In March of 1941, he listed his place of residence on West 77th Street in Manhattan in a declaration of intention. This form was the first step towards citizenship. America's entry into World War II put a pause on Leon's fashion career, but the draft was advantageous for Leon and other immigrants. Conscription fast-tracked his naturalization process, and the Army was where Leon met his lifelong partner, Warren Cronemeyer. The military presented transformative opportunities for gay men and lesbians particularly those who felt isolated in rural, sparsely populated communities. Most certainly, queer soldiers faced discrimination. Homosexuality was considered a mental illness and justification for a less than honorable discharge. But at the same time, lesbians and gay men found friendship, intimacy, a secret society, and in the case of Warren and Leon, they found love. In the late 1990s, Warren required extra support to care for Leon, who was suffering from Alzheimer's. Warren was struggling as the primary caregiver. Their social worker and doctor, that's Janet Kramer, who lives here in Brattleboro, and Bob Backus, asked why Leon wasn't receiving support from the VA. He was a veteran like Warren. Warren explained that Leon had no health benefits. Leon was discharged from the military without honor because he was homosexual. I was able to procure Leon's Section 8 discharge papers from the National Archives. Despite his specialty as an intelligence observer and his training as a Russian translator, he was deemed mentally unfit for service not eligible for re-enlistment, induction, or re-induction, not entitled to mustering out payment, and ultimately not entitled to veterans benefits. So Warren and Leon's friends and caregiving team urged them to have a civil union in 2001. I don't have to tell all of you, but the year before, Vermont made history as the first U.S. state to introduce civil unions for same-sex couples. Warren wrote his own, in his own obituary that he met Leon in 1944, the same year Leon was discharged from the Army. Warren began his military service in the Army Medical Corps as an ambulance driver. So if Leon had been hospitalized in 1944, which I learned from data from the National Archives, perhaps Warren was able to visit Leon at a mental institution. According to historian Alan Berube, the discharge process for homosexuals could include abusive interrogations about personal relationships or solitary confinement in hospitals and stockades. I can imagine Leon feeling isolated frightened and depressed. Did Warren, the ambulance driver who befriended him, provide comfort and courage to persevere? During a period of sheltering in place, my research into the lives of Warren and Leon was my vehicle to travel across time and space. I crossed the Atlantic with them on the Queen Elizabeth I was a guest at Leon's luxurious ancestral home in Tsarist Russia. 
I went to Weimar, Weimar cabarets, reviews, and queer nightclubs with Leon. I bicycled with Warren in the French Riviera, where he learned the antiques trade at the end of World War II. Warren disclosed to Dr. Backus of Grace Cottage um, that he was a European operative for the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. So perhaps those bicycle rides included clandestine meetings in cafes and in alleys with spies and saboteurs. I welcome all of you to my Mantiques Roadshow. My version of the PBS series is part adventure, part history lesson, part treasure hunt. But it's more than that. I want Warren and Leon's story to be a spark that ignites uh, all of you to share immigration narratives as well as stories of relatives or families of choice, biological or in the words of the writer Armistead Maupin, logical family. I want to give all of you permission to perhaps what you don't know about your ancestors. So here is your prompt. Based on stories, images, materials, or documents that you have about an ancestor, biological or logical, what can you suppose what can you imagine? What can you speculate? Can you describe or illustrate a significant moment in their life? So what we're going to do now is we're going to transition into a creative exercise. I'm going to pass out these Warley postcards. And on the back, I want you to draw a rectangle. like this. This is going to be your panel, as if you're making a comic book or a graphic memoir. And I want you to share with me a scene. You can draw it. You can just write it. You can do both. Um, what can you, perhaps, about an ancestor of yours? And then we're going to have about 10 minutes of this. We're going to play a little bit of music for you to get you into the mood. And when you're done, I invite all of you to put your finished card on this bulletin board here, this cork board here. Now remember, I'm not really a visual artist, uh, and this doesn't have to be perfect, okay? Just draw or write however you want, okay? So we're gonna pass these out now. again, based on stories, images, materials, or documents that you have about an ancestor. You may have very little, like I did at the start. Um, what can you suppose or imagine or speculate? Just draw me a scene that you can imagine about the life of this ancestor. Is that clear, everybody? Okay. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Louder. Louder? Is that better? Okay, good. I usually don't use a mic. I usually just yell. So um, <laughs> let me know if it, needs to be, if it needs to be louder or if it's too loud. Thank you. Um, 
I'm Kate Pralbert Quam. I'm the executive director of an organization here in Brattleboro called the Community Asylum Seekers Project. And Andy has graciously asked me to introduce and begin our panel discussion. Um, and so since I have the mic, I'll just say what we do a little bit and then I'll pass it on and my colleagues can introduce themselves. Um, Community Asylum Seekers Project is a small nonprofit that began in 2016. And our mission is to cultivate a supportive community for people in this country seeking asylum while providing basic needs and accompanying them on their journeys. And so the people that we support are in the country fleeing political violence in their countries of origin and seeking safety and stability uh, here in the United States and in Vermont. We have since 2016 supported about 25 people directly as well as some other folks indirectly. And we provide financial aid, legal aid, housing, job training and placement, um, school enrollment for kids and connections to lots and lots of local services provided by our small staff and our network of volunteers. Um, and we'll, we'll be saying more, I think, about the, what, what being an asylum seeker means, so I won't talk about that now, because I know there's lots of different kinds of pathways to this country that all have different ramifications and different um, challenges. And so we'll, we'll discuss that later. But first, I want to introduce and allow my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Abdullah. Um, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, my name is Abdullah. I'm the leader and facilitator of Art Lords Collective here in Brattleboro, Vermont. And first of all, thank you, uh, Andrew, for this uh, beautiful event that you held it. And thank you, Brooks Memorial Library, for hosting us all. Um, I'm also really proud to be the part of this community, uh, such a community that supports, uh, a community that notices every single thing about what we are doing in the community. And that makes us uh, to be more creative and more um, thoughtful about what we are doing. So thank you so much for all of you. Um, it's been six months that I have, uh, I'm living in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, uh, we are uh, working or um, I personally, I'm self-employed, so I'm more involved in artworks. We are doing murals and uh, artwork uh, in the town. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Alex Beck, and I'm the Welcoming Communities Manager with the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. Um, we are, in some ways, a very traditional economic development organization, and also I would say um, my role and my presence here really defines us as very different from many economic development organizations. So when we talk about what community and economic vibrancy looks like, um, the jobs are actually the easy part here in our community. And so I think we'll probably talk more about and um, explore um, what makes a community welcoming, what makes it a place where people choose to be and choose to make their homes, um, and how that impacts a, a, our community, almost always for the better. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Eduardo Melendez. I am here on behalf of uh, ECDC. They're the Ethiopian Community Development Council. Um, I supervise the Multicultural Community Center here, and we help um, refugees, um, initially Afghan uh, refugees, and we've since received uh, people from Guatemala. We've received uh, people from various countries in the African continent. So we um, first helped them gain the language through um, ESL, English as a Second Language. Um, and we also assist them in the search of housing work through our partners, uh, BDCC. We do, we do a lot of very, very uh, similar work. Um, and overall, our, our plan is to help, the, help those refugees resettle successfully here in Vermont with uh, language, job, schools. We provide them uh, a safe space so they can do uh, immunizations, vaccines, uh, right now we have yoga classes, we are doing uh, drive, safety driving courses, so we really strive to prepare them to uh, gain the independence 
and strength and support they need to be resettled here in, in southern Vermont. Thank you. So lots and lots of intersections here to talk about at the table. And then I think we want audience questions as well. So I think what, what I'll do just to start us off talking um, is ask a couple of questions that I think will elicit answers from everybody at the table. And then we can kind of just go wherever you know, the conversation takes us. But in um, reading about Andy's project, um, sort of disinterring Warren and Leon's past and remaking it and thinking about refugee support, asylum seeker support, migration justice, community, community building in that regard. One of the things that occurred to me um, was that there, there, are, there are some themes that unite many different kinds of migrations, whether across national borders or inside national borders, migrations from one community to another, one identity to another, one country to another. And two of them are the theme of displacement and the theme of making kin. And by making kin, I mean crafting new family structures by necessity. Um, displacement reshuffles our connections, and I think that kinship has long been a key survival strategy for queer folks, which is what makes me think a lot about Warren and Leon's process of kin making. Um, crafting new families from people who are not biologically related to you, but who become your family, who become your community. Um, we were all forced to reconsider and remake kinship to some extent in the early years of the COVID pandemic. You know, we, we figured out who to pod with and who was, who was our biological, our epidemiological community. Immigrant communities are forced to leave biological relatives behind and create new kinship communities as they remake place and remake their place in that place. Warren and Leon made kin with one another and with people we will probably never know about. And we all manufacture new ties in order to survive. And that fact deeply, expend, um, deeply affects the experience of crossing borders. So I'm wondering if other people at the table would speak a little bit to how the process of making kin affects your work in this community, and if it's your life that we're talking about, also affects your life. <laughs> wow, making kin in the process. Is this a personal question? It's um, first and foremost, uh, the work that we do at the Multicultural Community Center is essential for specifically that. Um, at the center, we, we've spoken about um, getting together for classes or getting together for sewing or uh, getting together, uh, together to, to have a, a, a celebration at the center. And many of them wouldn't have talked to one another living in the same place in Brattleboro if it wasn't for the Multicultural Community Center. Um, we see this up in, with our friends in Bennington because we also have uh, groups of refugees over there and volunteers. And they don't have this place to congregate, so people who live one street next to the other don't talk to one another. So I, I believe that the center has been uh, the heart for creating that, that kinship and that community again amongst themselves and amongst the uh, the Vermont community. Me? I am actually from Puerto Rico. And even though, for those who know, we are US, uh, we are US citizens, but we're not Americans. So it's a very different, if it's a very different uh, cultural adaptation, climate uh, adaptation, I came together with uh, my wife, who was pregnant, and three other children. Um, and we were running away also from those climate disasters and uh, failing infrastructure. And if it wasn't for the kindness of, of Vermonters, we wouldn't really have made it. So we've, we've also found that kinship here in, in Vermont and in Brattleboro. I think that's, that's about it for me. Andy, you want to um, Yeah, part of this project and discovering this project was trying to better understand 
uh, my own kin, you know, there's my immediate branch of the family, the Ingleside, who is from the Ukraine, and then there was Warren's, sorry, Leon's side of the family uh, from Russia, from Rostov, Russia. And um, my, my own questions about uh, why these branches of the family tree were severed. Um, and part of me feeling grief that my family, my biological family, weren't the ones to take care of Orrin and Leon when they were elders and how we lost touch with them and how my family had no idea they went up to Vermont after they left New York. Um, but on the other hand, I'm so grateful to this family of choice the logical family of Townsend that ended up taking care of them and became the primary kin. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I think my story also resonates with the story of Warren and Engel, as they have been uh, migrated two times in their lives, and that's the same with me. Once I migrated to Pakistan from a very heart of Afghanistan, which is somewhere in the middle of uh, mountains and uh, valleys, uh, rivers. From there, we migrated to Pakistan, and then I grew up there. Until 2016, we, we, we went back. We relocated to Afghanistan, Kabul city. And then again in 2021, I migrated to uh, Albania and then here. So. It's a two-time migration. And I think uh, bad things happen, but bad things also lead me to best places like USA, and I'm happy my dream came true. And I'm in a community that is very artistic, and like somewhere, a lot of art for a small community, and where I can find out myself, where a lot of tiny things that we do are really appreciated and that really makes us to do more and more and i'm really looking forward to do a lot of artwork in the town not just the town but broadly other places as well and yeah <laughs> yeah it's in the uh, mid top of the, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, that story is from about my, about my father during his youth when he was 17 and he was, uh, there was a time in Afghanistan that military service was like compulsory, that you have to do it when you are youth. Two years of your youth have to be uh, serviced under military for the country and he was doing that the same. And uh, unfortunately, that he never went to school, and he he went from Panjshir, which is the middle of Afghanistan, not the middle, but the heart of Afghanistan, where there are like mountains. There were no schools at those times, nothing. And going to Kabul city was something like, uh, if you go there, you will become an atheist. You will become like. Uh, uh, out of religion, and it's very evil thing to go there. So when he went there, he started his life, and he had to do military as well. So there was uh, there is also another thing that um, why some one one day in his life that they were like um, uh, uh, repeating the national anthem, and because the national anthem was in Pashto language which is the national language of Afghanistan. It's very difficult, just like Russian. So because his native language was Persian and he didn't know Pashto, um, and all of a sudden while they were just standing and they were repeating the national anthem, and the head of the military service of the army, while he stands in front of the, all the army, uh, he, he said to all of them just stop and he came directly to my father and he asked him that, can you repeat the national anthem? And he couldn't. He just literally forgot the national anthem at the moment because it was in, not in his language. He just memorized that. And that head of the army, he just slapped him very hard. like, And he was just 17, very young. It really feels bad when you uh, feel like that. 
And I was like imagining while he was all narrating his story about his youth. And then he said that all what he was doing on him, slapping him, was just wanted to do something uh, lascivious or flirtatious, like wanted to somehow like have physicals with him because he was so uh, in, a, in a control, he had power and because my father was young, a young guy, young man. So that was uh, the story and I really felt bad about that when I was uh, like young and I heard about that, his story. So yeah, that's very uh, like heart touching, something that happens in the life and that was uh, the very uh, most important story of his life that I always remember. And I just um, sketched that a little bit of that. Yeah, thank you. So I think there's, you know, the personal response to this question is I feel quite lucky. Um, I'm of a generation and from a place where um, I was, you know, adopted through a Jewish adoption agency by my mom and dad, and then they got divorced and both remarried women. Um, and I am the youngest. I have two stepbrothers and three stepsisters. And, and I mention that I'm the youngest because when we talk about kin, um, I was of an age in which, um, while more older siblings is never fun, um, I had the opportunity to learn about this chosen kinship in a really positive way. Um, you know, as a, as a very young person, um, you don't get, to, I, I didn't get to pick my family, but I think it really showed that biological family and how you build family can look very different, and that was very positive. So I think that's, my, you know, from a personal perspective. Um, from a professional perspective, I think that this is um, in part of the work that communities um, need to think about when we're talking about becoming welcoming is, is there the space and the opportunity for folks to create and find this kinship? So, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, we have um, tens of thousands of job openings in, in the state of Vermont. So the reason why we aren't as welcoming of different folks from a variety of backgrounds and income levels isn't because of um, jobs, for instance, right? That's what the economic development, you know, line is like more jobs, more people. But we know that doesn't work. Um, you know, you don't only need a job, you need kinship, you need community, you need to feel fulfilled and be fulfilled. And so in some ways, um, that's how our organization was dragged into this work, was because we know that the old school economic stuff isn't enough. And it is, how do we create the space for kinship and, and connection? Um, I don't have answers, you know, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm listening as much, but um, being able to spend time thinking about these questions is what is, I think, unique to, to, to this work. Yeah, thank you. And switching to my panelist hat, I would say that for, from our perspective as Community Asylum Seekers Project, um, we see asylum seekers make kin in all kinds of ways. And some folks are forced to leave their biological kin behind. Um, we support a lot of young parents who had to leave children um, and are, are, you know, in the long process of trying to reunite with them. But we also see people who fled violence from their families, their biological families of origin. Um, in some cases, in about a lot of the cases of folks we support, violence based, violence as a response to folks' sexuality um, and folks' gender identity. And, you know, in, in those and lots of other cases, we see really, really incredible and inspiring processes of making kin, um, especially in the process of crossing the southern border and being detained. So a lot of the folks that we support from both Latin America and from the African continent come across the southern border of the United States and are locked in ICE and private detention facilities for a long time. In the process of crossing the southern border, a lot of the people that we serve had to undergo pretty unimaginable journeys of near death, um, you know, physically taxing um, migration pathways, especially through Panama. Um, and in both of those sites, both crossing the Darien Gap in Panama and crossing the southern border and being locked up, there's a lot of kinship ties that are made that seem to endure for years and years and years. So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many stories I've gotten to hear about people carrying other people's kids across a river or, 
you know, somebody gets released from detention and then remembers, has the phone numbers of four of the other women they were detained with. And when those women get out, you better believe they're coming to Brattleboro, you better believe they're sleeping on a couch, you know, because there, there's a kinship there that seems to endure. Um, and, and there is some kind of what I guess you would call chain migration that happens in southern Vermont because people forge these ties along the migration process and then, um, you know, continue to insist on welcoming their sisters and brothers, right, that they, that they met along the way. So, um, yeah, it does seem like that's a, a, common, a common theme. Does anybody have any else, anything else they want to say about it or should I move on to another question? Okay. I have one question that's specifically for Abdullah and Andy about the arts. Um, I, was, I was privileged to have the opportunity because of this panel to start looking through The Most Costly Journey, which I had had on my shelf for a while and hadn't you know, gotten into. Um, and in this compilation, the, there's, there's one speaker who calls himself the Migrante de, de Hidalgo um, from Mexico. And he says, I have discovered that art is a passion. That passion, it's something that one has inside oneself that won't let you go along the wrong road because many of us feel alone. And what is the least we can do? Art has filled me with so much spirit. And he credits his own pursuit of the arts with his own survival, um, living in you know, rural northern Vermont and working on a dairy farm, right? And so I'm wondering, for the two of you, both speaking of your, you know, your kin's artistic processes and of the art lords, what's the role of creativity in making a place? You know, and in connecting the self to new cultures, new lives, new geographies, um, new, new communities. What's the role of art for you? Um, I think that for me, art has been always um, a tool or a weapon to use it, to use it like to express myself. Like in Afghanistan, we are not that open to express ourselves, even briefly. Openly is a very, uh, a very far away word. So uh, then art for me has been a very uh, powerful tool to use it to express myself. Then nobody just cares that much what he is showing in his heart, uh, like in Afghanistan. N I wouldn't say nobody, but uh, there will be a lot of people that they don't like or don't care about what we are showing. But because my uh, art has been more of uh, nude, uh, nude or naked guys that depicts their uh, lives, their emotions, so that's how I have been doing since uh, last year that I'm creating artwork of myself, about myself, and that's how uh, it makes me creative and also it makes me to express myself as much as I can very openly, and I don't care, I don't scare from anyone. And the other thing that so far we are doing in the town, for the town, that's also another part of the story that uh, uh, I love doing it. I, I just take out a lot of time. I do have my schedules, but I take a lot of time to just go on the wall and paint as much as I can. So art, we, we would like to, and we, we are looking forward to do a lot of artwork in the town to, in order to make the town uh, colorful and the, and also that makes us, uh, gives a lot of chances to be creative and a lot of creativity is going, uh, is upcoming in the town. Yeah. Um, Abdul, that word you used, making the town colorful, that's the exact expression that was used to describe um, Leon and Warren when they moved to Townsend. They added color, they added life to the town, and it, it definitely goes both ways. Um, you know, I, I talked about how uh, when I met Warren and Leon's friends, who are now in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, I just told them how grateful I was for them, uh, and they said, you know, we got so much out of Warren and Leon, you know. They uh, brought so much energy to Townsend. Um, they had this wonderful antique shop. Um, and uh, yeah, I think in many ways, you know, to your point, Kate, that you know, art is a is something that can be portable and that you can you can take with you wherever you are. 
um, it becomes home in a way. Um, and I have to add also that, that Eduardo sitting next to me is also uh, a creative person. We didn't get to mention that he's a photojournalist and he documented uh, much of the aftermath of uh, Maria and other hurricanes, uh, other disasters, um, and all of the corruption and the activism that was going on uh, in the past several years before he left for uh, Vermont. Um, uh, so creativity is a way to, can be a way to, to heal and process trauma. Um, uh, and uh, I know for sure that for Leon, it was so important to keep that artwork, what we saw on the slide deck, his artwork from, that dated back from the 1930s. He still kept those spiral sketchbooks. Um, and it was so important for him that the legacy would continue and he wanted um, Eliza Thompson to have them. Um, Um, I, I have a master's degree in uh, fine arts um, from the Miami International University. Um, I actually uh, worked, uh, I think it was around 2014, with the uh, Bienal de las Fronteras. It's a Mexican biennial in Tamaulipas, Mexico, and um, I helped building it up and um, creating the Spanish and English catalog. Um, I've exhibited myself, uh, both my, my fine arts work, photography, and my documentation. I worked with uh, Mother Jones, Honolulu Civil Beat, um, and many other medias back in, in Puerto Rico. Um, so, yeah. I'm curious what you think of this concept of using art to process trauma. Art is healing. Um, art is healing, and um, my my undergrad is actually psychology, and I was the reason I kind of make the jump is because I got very interested in the the power that art has in releasing trauma and uh, healing past wounds. Um, in any way, shape, or form, um, I myself I like to write a lot. I have a whole bunch of notebooks that um, I hope nobody finds uh, after I'm gone. Um, I'm not that kind of writer, um, but you know, people make art, uh, people write essays, uh, people paint uh, pictures, uh, people make pictures with camera, and all this is, is part of healing and healing trauma, yes. Yeah, thank you all. I love the idea too that, you know, um, talking about using art to make place, I think happens on the individual level when a person has their artwork in front of them, it helps to cement their, their place in that world. But art lords are literally making place, right? Like you're painting Brattleboro, right? So it's like this place is not gonna be the same as before you got here, right? Which is really a, a perfect sort of, you know, metaphor for the, the cultural process that's taking place, you know, yeah. Right, yeah, creative placemaking by, by virtue of the actual art that's happening and by virtue of the human interactions that happen all over the town. Yeah. One of the things that, that seems to mark Leon's experience, as Andy's work has revealed, is that it is what might be called intersectional, which is a sort of college-type word. Um, that is, his experience is marked by more than one border crossing and more than one kind of repression. Neither being gay, nor being a migrant, nor a refugee, defines his experience totally. It's the combination of those things that tells the story of the world he navigated. And his experience of being a refugee was different than a refugee who didn't navigate that world. Um, at the same time, he might have had access to a comfortable lifestyle, at least eventually, that other migrants did not have. He was also, at least by today's definition of whiteness, white, right? Considering those power structures, I'm wondering how the panelists would answer this question. Um, what divides the community that you belong to or that you serve? And how can those divisions be part of our project of welcoming? How can we pay attention to divisions of access within the community who comes here? And how can those be part of our project of welcoming? Right? 
Sure. Um, preserving the Vermont way is something you hear often, and I think it's something you know more frequently used uh, as, as a counterpoint towards development. Um, but I think it is equally as important to think about when we talk about our communities and our cultures and, and really thinking about what that means. And so when I think of what divides our community, um, as you know, Vermont is the second most homogenous state in the country, um, but Brattleboro is a uniquely worldly community. And so I think um, art is a great example of something that is, um, it's a portal between what separates, I think, many folks and cultures, and it's something that um, we're, we're, we do well here. But I, but I also think that um, we still struggle with um, the idea that change is good you know, mo most folks, whether consciously or subconsciously, believe change is a loss. And I think that until, you know, when we as an organization have been saying we need to increase the population, we actually initially said we need to increase the workforce, and then we decided that's not actually it. We need to increase the population. And I think that is where people started asking, well, why? Um, it is clear, I hope, from this panel, why? You know, the, the economic impact of, you know, to um, you know, antique shop owners and you know, in Townsend wasn't what they brought that made Townsend more vibrant. The the artwork again that you know, and art's another great example of 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 why being really open to more people and not ask, well, who are they? Because I think that's something our, our community still does. Um, so again, coming from within, and, and that's that's something I see that I think it's you. Um, it's been a unique struggle in, in having this conversation for years. You know, we need more people and what that means and what reaction that elicits in our community members is um, one of the more difficult parts of my job, unfortunately, is, is the responses to that. that that's a hard question. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um. In speaking of what might um, cut or impede this this process, I think that um, having a community that doesn't have an, an open mind, um, it's a real impediment to to allowing people to to grow and, and flourish. I, I think I use this example a lot. Um, when I was doing research to where do I want to move with my, my biracial family in the United States, um, well, Vermont keep, kept popping up and popping up, and um, it always talked about the, how accepting um, the Brattleboro community is, but I always asked myself, but it's all white. How, how can we put that to the test? Um, I'm glad some of you are laughing. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, we did the research and um, we decided to come to Brattleboro, uh, Brattleboro Vermont. And um, lo and behold, most of you remember when um, we had visitors from New Hampshire um, waving Nazi flags and walk down the street. It felt like, but we just got here, please stop, you know. Not connected, but it happens and it happens everywhere. And um, from this side of of the fence, Brattleboro has been very unique in that neither me or my family, we've had any issues because of the color of our skin or because sometimes you'll catch us on the street speaking Spanish or because of our accent. Um, and I get that just crossing the bridge um, in the other state. So this is Brattleboro specifically, to my experience, it's a hub of very open-minded, very well-informed, uh, educated people who are willing to lend a hand and help and let anybody grow, you know, not be an impediment to growth, but uh, aid in the growth, so. Um, can you just repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think we're talking about multiple kinds of divisions, which is really, really interesting. And what I was asking about initially was d 
division among the community of refugees, right? Like Leon was persecuted differently because he was gay. Um, and so I was thinking about what sort of differences in access to benefits or status or belonging divide the, the community of immigrants today and how can we make that part of our project of welcoming. But you can also talk about, you know, divisions of power that your community faced when they got here. Anything that seems relevant is a great answer. I think uh, there are uh, many differences in the community. I mean, uh, our community, the Afghan community, 100, about 130 people who resettled from last year until now in Vermont. So there are different people, different, uh, because Afghanistan is very diverse, so there are different uh, mentalities, uh, different races, different et ethnicities. And also, um, I might say, um, different sexualities as well. So uh, I think that there, there are a lot of ways to approach them in order to uh, find out and support them in a way that uh, your organization can do that um, in order to uh, decrease the traumas, the negative energies that they have brought with themselves. Uh, you know, your point, Abdul, about diversity with sexualities um, is making me think about my first talk in this area when I spoke at Grace Cottage in Townsend. Uh, it was a very, it was a moment of synergy because both Grace Cottage Hospital and Valley Cares, the affordable senior community, were essentially launching this initiative to make their spaces more affirming um, more welcoming of LGBTQ plus elders. Um, and that was my hope with this project too, is to make people think about how we care for vulnerable populations, particularly LGBTQ plus elders and refugees. Um, and I'm curious, you know, this hospital and the, the, the nursing facility have developed these um, uh, strategies to make themselves more inclusive and to be more mindful of people with difference. And I'm curious, what's going on with organizations like CASP, um, like ECDC, in terms of helping to train staff? You know, what's going on in that arena? Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And I'll say for us at CASP, it's, it's come up a lot in the last year in terms of a place where our organization needs to go. Um, about a third of the folks we support right now are queer folks. Um, a, a huge plurality of asylum seekers, particularly from Central America, are trans. And so there is going to come a time when we are asked, you know, people come to us in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal. But we're essentially asked to support people. There will come a time when we are asked to support a trans asylum seeker, or many, hopefully, trans asylum seekers. And so in looking forward to preparing our community best to do that, um, we started with some kind of workshops internally about gender identity to just build a shared and common language among our volunteers, many of whom haven't really been exposed to diverse, diversity of gender identities, um, which is always a fascinating conversation to be part of, right? Because, you know, as I'm sure you know, when people who haven't been privileged to consider their sexuality and gender identity get a chance to, it's always a really rich conversation. And folks come out of it with new realizations about themselves and new questions about themselves that are like super fun to watch. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, I, I think that this is a, a, a key part of our support too, and not just in terms of differences of sexuality, but, you know, when we have a 94% 94, 94 white state and then we have an influx of immigrants, there's gonna be a tendency to homogenize those folks. You know, and forget stories about like Abdullah's dad who was slapped in the face for speaking Dari instead of Pashto, right? And there are differences in power that have to do with language of origin, differences in power that have to do with access to power and, you know, connections to institutions of power. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about, was it Warren who worked for the OSS? So the OSS eventually becomes the CIA. CIA eventually trains the Taliban, right? Like there's some divisions of power on the ends of this table, right? In terms of like where the refugee history 
laces through history, right? I don't know how to phrase that better, but um, you know, the fact the fact that we have a community of immigrants isn't necessarily going to mean that we have like kumbaya, every, everybody has the same access to power. You know, like Eduardo's organization and my organization serve people with very different access because you guys work through the State Department and we work through back alleys, you know? So like, you know, a refugee, for example, arrives with benefits that humanitarian parolees and SIV seekers do not arrive with because the state decides who deserves it and who doesn't, right? So we're all kind of working on navigating those things. Um, and trying to make that part of our project of welcoming, also to lift from the bottom and make sure that everybody who arrives here has access to what they need. Yeah, um, so what I'll say is, you know, working directly with uh, businesses, um, they are eager to learn. And what I, what I have internalized most is how our country and often our state categorizes and separates folks based on really um, semantic distinctions like, um, certain folks from some countries, if they come through the United States in the exact same way as others, some get benefits and some don't. Um, it is, um, you know, it's certainly cruel and doesn't make sense and all the things we know about like American immigration policy generally, but it's also confusing. And I think it really, you know, shifts the focus on treating someone or acknowledging someone's humanity and instead they're focusing on, okay, well, this person's work permits are good forever and this person's work permits expire in, in, in you know, every two years and like, I'm responsible for this and like, you know, these, all these people speak one language so I can hire an interpreter for all of them, but these two guys speak a different language and so now what do we do? And, I, and the reason why it isn't as easy as it should be is because of how we categorize folks and how we create access to resources. And if you come from one country, you can go to the Department of Labor and they'll pay for all the stuff you need to get a good job. And if you come from a different country, you may have to wait two years just to, to be eligible to work and to access those same resources. And, and so it is, um, and these are people who are here now in our community, right? They're not, it's not hypothetical. And so I see those divisions structurally um, really doing harm to uh, the long-term ability for well-meaning folks to be supportive of everyone equitably, right? Because if the system is inequitable, how do you treat everyone equitably in, in a workplace? You know, and, and that's something that um, is really uh, important that we're, we're trying to figure out how to do better. Did you want to say anything about the PDC? Yeah. And um, just to uh, piggyback on what Alex was saying, at ECDC, I think that one of our uh, prime directives is educating them in English. First, the first tool you need to give an immigrant is to be able to handle the language. They don't have to be a poet, but they need to be able to hold a conversation in in their community. And I think that's the first uh, key of 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 entering the 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 community. And it's something that that we support from the very beginning. Um, we haven't noticed at ECDC as much um, when it comes to, you know, colloquially coming out. Um, but I've always attributed it to the fact that it takes time to find a place, a safe place within yourself to start asking yourself these questions. And I know that we have to be patient, but I'm, I'm very sure that um, when the time comes, they, they are going to show themselves and we are more than, than equipped to give them the support and the need and the safe space that, that they will need. Yeah. Andy, do we go till 3.30 or 4? Yeah, audience, yeah, that's what I was thinking too. There's lots more we can say, but you know, audience hasn't said anything yet, so. Does anybody have questions either about the experiences of people on the panel or the, the work of the organizations that we represent? Or the connections to the story that brought us here? Uh, and, and related to connections, um, I'm wondering the best way to honor our new Muslim friends and their relationship to sexuality. Because I, I know that uh, uh, 
there are restrictions regarding the religion and sexuality. So that's my question, because I've run into this personally with friends and, um, and our new Muslim friends. At ECDC, on this new phase, we just came out in October in, from our one-year celebration um, of the successes of the, the population that's resettling. And part of the projects that um, we have now, we're looking into um, some partnerships um, to bring forth uh, uh, education for women. Um, uh, uh, sexual education, um, contraceptives, um, prenatal care, because one of the things that we've identified is that some of these women hide their pregnancies because it's a mark of shame. And um, we, we want to bring the bread of knowledge into the community to know what rights and what services are available and what will be best and have them make the choice. Um, so yeah, it's uh, healthcare and healthcare in general. It's it's part of something that that we help um, by helping them get appointments, uh, go to appointments, follow up on appointments. Um, so it's it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just interject too before I pass the mic on that I'm always cautious of painting Islam as universally conservative on this matter and not other religions. You know, as someone who was raised in the Christian church, I can say we've got plenty of anti-queerness ourselves to go around. Um, and, you know, as a queer person myself, yeah, right, represent. Um, you know, as a queer person myself, I am always wary about what they call pinkwashing, which is like, you know, using support of LGBTQ communities to be a little bit colonial, you know? And so I, I don't want us to, to paint Islam with that brush either, which isn't to say that it's not a challenge, right? But that it's not, it's a shared challenge for many of us and our, our faith communities. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, as Kate said, that it's a shared challenge, and we have a lot of uh, religious restrictions in every religion uh, rather than uh, uh, Islam. Even in Christianity, I've read the Christianity, I've read Judaism. Islam is the, it's a, it's a religion that tells the story of every other religious to us. So uh, we, I and I as a Muslim, I know all about uh, the other stories that, that happen in Christianity and Judaism and prior to that from Adam to until now. So, but there's a thing that how we perceive this, this, this stuff, like, the verses of Quran, the verses of uh, um, Bible and the other holy books, how we perceive that's in our own. And how the priest says to that, uh, and how they just uh, impose that on us and manipulate those things in our mind since childhood, that's another thing. But I, as myself, that I'm growing now and I'm learning, it's very different, and I'm, I'm perceiving the verses of Quran very differently. There are things that, that have been told about sexuality which are restricted, but how, what God meant, that is very different, and it's very difficult to catch those words, what God really meant. But this is the other people that they are uh, translating those words and the way that they perceive. Now it's my turn. Let me speak how I perceive, uh, perceive that uh, word, those uh, verses of Quran. So I think it's, uh, it's about the person and uh, sexuality, these stuffs, these are the pers um, personal stuff. So it's the person that decides how he wants to be, how she wants to be, or whatever. So there, uh, I think there shouldn't be any restrictions in any religion or any law or anything because these things are really uh, personal. There should be rules accordingly, like consensual sex or like other stuff, but um, this, uh, I believe that everything is very personal and uh, regarding to sexuality. I'm breastfeeding, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing everything I want. 
I just wanted to piggyback on that. You know, how do you guys guard the line between um, supporting cultural differences, right? Because one of the things when you move from a different um, from a different cultural, even if if even if it's from a territory of the United States, there's an immediate cultural shock, and there's a way of this is how things are done. Let me teach you how it's the way. And for someone who comes from a different culture, it's like, ooh, 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 wait, there's more than one way of doing things right. Yeah. You know, and how do you work to balance, you know, expression of culture and, you know, also um, opening conversations to, you know, these are some rights that you may not know about um, that are, that you have access to or that exists here without, you know, um, having that colonialist um, whip of, no, that you have to let go of those things because they're, they're um, not uh, quite right. How do you? I love the idea of, of thinking about that as, here's what you have access to here. And also, you know, yeah, there's more than one way of doing right something right there's also more than one way of doing things in the United States we're not a unified culture you know we're not one thing um, maybe in southern Vermont right there, there might be a little bit more unification but even there it's limited right so I, I love the notion of like pointing to a door and saying hey that door is open for what it's worth it's open you know don't push through it don't you know force people to accept things that they're not used to point to the door the door will do the work you know um, that's my, my immediate impulse to that. And I am thinking of a lot of funny stories that asylum seekers have told me about that you want some. <laughs> There's one in particular that I think is, is good for us to consider what kind of support we offer. And it's this family that came to live in Brattleboro and, and we surrounded them with a team of volunteers, just like ECDC does, to support them. And the first week they move into this apartment and uh, the woman calls me and she goes, the volunteers are downstairs. They're like digging up the yard. And we're like, what, why is it, why, why? And so I call our volunteer coordinator, Christy, and she goes, oh yeah, somebody was saying something about planting an organic garden so that they could like have homegrown vegetables. And so this mom, she says to me on the phone, she goes downstairs and she talks to the volunteers. And then she comes up and she goes, Kate, comadre, que diablos es kale? <laughs> what the hell is kale? <laughs> you know, and she goes, I don't want that, you know, and they grew a little bit and she's like, I'm not going to, I, I didn't come here to work in the fields, you know, and she doesn't eat kale. She has like a, a really sensitive stomach that cannot handle like a thick, fibrous, leafy green vegetable. It composted and it was great compost, but like, you know, that's not what they asked for. Um, and they didn't need their diets to be like critiqued and massaged and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, you have more? You gave me a look. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a great question, though. Like, I, and I love the way Adriana is talking about, the, as also an employee of ECDC, by the way, um, how to point to an open door and, and then see what happens, right? I think is a really good way to do that. Yeah, and one thing I'll say, so, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is bad, generally, um, I think, in terms of the order in which um, we presume all of those different things are needed. Um, I've seen, ones I've seen is if you tip it over on its side and that we need to create time and energy on all of the things um, that again, and on that hi the hierarchy of needs. But you know, t talking about self-actualization, and I think it you know, can intersect with, you know, especially in a fiercely independent nation like ours, um, is that you know, how do you, how does someone feel comfortable walking through that door? Or um, do they have that stability or sense of self or the time and space to create kin? Um, so that if they do, as an example, um, self-identify in a way that folks from their former kin may not appreciate or support, having that new kin or that chosen kin, that is part of that self-actualization and their ability to step into themselves. And I think that in that, again, the, you need to create space for that culturally in the community and um, stability, you know, I, I, in, in, in all of these different aspects of life. And so I think that's something that we often think about is we cannot compel anyone to do anything. Um, and so how do we 
support folks and again open the door but opening the door isn't enough in a place like southern vermont you know a lot of the doors feel like they're open but are they um and so what do we need to do to make sure fe people feel comfortable walking through the door i think is really what that work is um and so that's kind of just resonated with me a bit yeah. thank you we have time for one more question if there is one, sure. of the multicultural center and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about how that came about. Great. All right, so the, uh, the Multicultural Community Center um, came about um, because of um, Joe Wea and Thomas Huddleston, who were the, the very first two people in uh, the branch of ECDC Vermont. Um, there's many ECDCs around the United States, um, and we all do the same thing. We assist in the uh, resettlement efforts of refugee and some asylum seekers. Um, so the Multicultural Community Center came about as an idea to have this one safe place where they could take classes and join together in community. And uh, with the summer program, it began with the English classes provided uh, by one of our partners, uh, SIT World Learning. Um, and it turned into bringing in a sewing team so women could, speaking about those cultural differences, could come together and start creating a community amongst themselves while, while they're learn, they learn sewing. Um, then uh, we have the art lords who uh, use the space, they have meetings in there and um, uh, they for some time had one little space that they could use as a studio if they wanted to. Um, with uh, the help of BDCC, we launched a computer literacy program. You know, teach them, those who already are at the level, teach them how to use uh, a computer because everybody knows that almost every service now it's online. You know, you can buy your groceries online, you can make a doctor's appointment online, you can order pizza online. So. Um, give them the basics to also gain that knowledge and that freedom in, in, in our community. And little by little, projects started happening. Now we have consistently coming twice a week um, agents from uh, the Vermont Department of Labor who also assist them um, in, in finding jobs and everything they do from helping you buy equipment if you get a new job, helping you buy clothes if you don't have clothes for your job interview, so all of these uh, services come in together. We just had the Vermont uh, Department of Health conduct um, an immunization clinic at the Multicultural Community Center. So we have this one place right by the uh, Etsy buildings. It's building number six on the second floor. Everybody's welcome to come visit. Um, and you know, it, again, going back, it became this one safe place where the refugee community could meet, could create community, could uh, learn and, and share, not just amongst themselves, but people from other countries that we are resettling and Vermonters like yourself that we also have in, in, our, in our staff. So it's, it's truly a multicultural community center where we all come together and, and like we've mentioned, we, we have many doors, we show them all, and you can walk through whichever door you want to walk through. And if you want someone to hold your hand, uh, we have a very ex extensive team of volunteers and co-sponsors that will help you through the process. I think we have to wrap up. Um, I just wanna thank all of you in the audience for showing up today. I especially want to thank our four speakers, Eduardo, Kate, Alex, Abdullah. Um, I find all of you heroic, but I think all of you feel like I'm just doing my job. And uh, I'm really grateful f to all of you and to Vermont Humanities for making this vision I had come true. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I can't think of a better way to spend this afternoon. It, it's been a pleasure to get to know all of you, um, and particularly for me, Maria Elena, because she is lovely. <laughs> um, also, I do want to just let people know that on Wednesday, we will be having our first Wednesday lecture, which is 
um, by Merrick, who is the editor of The Most Costly Journey, so we can come and hear more stories and his vision of how comics create community. So I hope you all come back for that. And in case you need to remember all the wonderful things that happen here, you can sign up for our newsletter online, and we'd be happy to do it for you at the desk so you don't miss anything. And thanks again to our panel and to Vermont Humanities. Uh, thank you so much. Again, I just uh, wanted to, uh, not advertisement, but just I wanted to inform you all that on November 19, we have a film screening uh, at Epsilon Spires. It's free of tickets. Uh, it's an Afghan movie uh, from America. The production is from of USA, but it's a very good movie. If any one of you wanted to come and watch, you can come. It's on November 19 at 8 p.m. Thank you so much. <laughs>